types of crystalline solids. So crystalline, okay, start over, solids. Solids can be crystalline or amorphous. The word amorphous, this prefix a is, means without. Anarchy means without order or without law. Amorphous means without shape. There's no long-range order. It's just a jumble of particles. There's no rhyme or reason. Crystalline refers to a well-ordered array of atoms or molecules. There's a pattern here, and it repeats in three dimensions. It's, it's regular. So we're going to look at the crystalline solids, and those can be further divided into three categories, molecular, ionic, and atomic. So here's a nice flow chart that gives us the whole thing in one slide. Crystalline solids. One subcategory are molecular solids. The particles in molecular solids are molecules. And so those molecules are held together by intermolecular forces. So if you have strong intermolecular forces, you'll have higher melting and boiling points. But intermolecular forces in general are fairly weak, and so these are generally going to have low melting points compared to some of the others. An example of a molecular solid is water. Ionic solids have ions as their particles. See how cryptic these names are? Ionic solids. So they've got ions, cations and anions. And we've mentioned this before, there's not really a molecule in an ionic compound. Whatever the piece is, is like one ginormous molecule because it's cation, anion, cation, anion, all the way through. It's held together by ionic bonds, which are very strong. There are no intermolecular forces because there aren't any molecules. The atoms are held together by ionic bonds. So these tend to have very high melting points. Have you ever seen table salt melt? No. You can get it to melt, but it takes a really, really high temperature. It's well over 1,000 degrees Celsius. Then we have atomic solids. Atomic solids have atoms as their individual pieces. These have varying melting points. Because what's holding atoms together? Dispersion forces, right? Dispersion forces, if you just have dispersion forces, the melting and boiling points are going to be very low. What about things like gold, though? Gold is held together by metallic bonds that I'm pretty sure there's a slide coming up on. OK, so then this is all the details, right? Molecular solids, they're held together by intermolecular forces. They tend to have low melting points. I'm not going to read all of these. You can read them. Ionic solid, um, these have formula units. They have ions as their particles. They're held together by ionic bonds, which are very strong. And so then they tend to have a high melting point. Oh, I guess it wasn't over 1,000. 801, still very high. Then the atomic solids. OK, so are you getting the idea that scientists like to categorize things? right? <laughs> so we can take the atomic solids and put those into three different categories. Because some of them melt at very low temperatures and some at high temperatures. It has to do with how they're held together. So covalent solids, covalent atomic solids. These are atoms that are covalently bonded to each other. They're going to have very high melting points because covalent bonds are very strong. The melting and boiling point depends on how strong the forces are that hold the thing together. Silicon is an example of a covalent bond. The silicon atoms are actually covalently bonded to each other. Then you have non-bonding atomic solids. These are held together by dispersion forces. These have very low melting points. The noble gases are actually the only non-bonding atomic solids. And then you have metallic solids. These are held together by metallic bonds. They still have variable melting points because some of them, like mercury, is liquid at room temperature, right? And gallium is a fun one. It's a solid at room temperature, but if you hold it in your hand, your body heat is enough to melt it. It's pretty cool. And then other things like aluminum and iron have high melting points, and we can use them to cook food, right? You can stick them in the oven for 500 degrees Celsius, I mean Fahrenheit, 
and, and they're not going to melt. That'd be a bummer if they did. So details, again, on those divisions. Covalent solids held together by covalent bonds. Diamond is another example. A diamond is pure carbon. The carbon atoms are covalently bonded together in a crystalline manner, very organized structure, and it's very strong. It has a high melting point, and it's also very, very strong. You can cut glass with it. They estimate that diamond would melt at about 3,800 degrees Celsius. So a diamond crystal can be thought of as one giant molecule. Here's, here's an illustration of that. The carbon atoms are actually covalently bonded to each other. There's no intermolecular forces involved here. It's all covalent bonds. The non-bonding solids, um, just the dispersion forces to hold them together. Xenon's going to melt at about minus 112. But, well, it would, it would melt if it was frozen. So you can get it to go from a liquid, I'm sorry, from a gas to a liquid somewhere above minus 112. And if you keep getting it colder and colder, you can get it to freeze at minus 112. If you get it colder, it'll just be a colder solid. If you let it warm up, it'll melt at minus 112. Metallic atomic solids um, are held together by metallic bonds. Um, the simplest model, the only one we're going to talk about, is we think about the, the atoms as each losing one or more of their electrons and so then we have ions held together in a sea of electrons. These have variable uh, melting points because the metallic bond strength varies. Iron melts at 1809. Mercury melts at minus 39. So this is an illustration of the electron C model of metallic bonding. I think of this as being uh, like a neighborhood. And so each of these... Um, atoms is a house, and here we've got the electrons being little boys again. And the moms send the little boys out to play, and they're free to roam around the neighborhood. But all those little boys out in the neighborhood kind of pulls the moms together because we're all watching out for these little kids together. So I like it or not, that's my analogy. But this explains why. Um, a, metals conduct electricity, because if these electrons are not being held by one particular atom, if they're free to move, then they can move over and conduct electricity. <coughs> so this is a type of question you should be able to answer. Again, I missed on the formatting. That's a subscript 3. Identify each as molecular, ionic, or atomic. This is actually easier than it appears at first glance. We already learned to identify whether compounds were ionic or molecular, right? A molecular compound is going to be a molecular solid. An ionic compound is going to be an ionic solid. An element is going to be an atomic solid. So if we look at NH3, N is a nonmetal and H is a nonmetal. Is this what kind of a compound is that? That's a molecular compound, right? In order to be a, an ionic compound, it would have to have a metal in it. So it's a molecular compound. So what are the particles? They're molecules. So this is a molecular solid. How about calcium oxide? What kind of an element is calcium? It's a metal, right? Oxygen is a nonmetal. Metal, nonmetal, ionic compound, ionic solid. I'm not trying to trick you. Krypton, is that a compound? No. No, it's an element. It doesn't have ions, it doesn't have molecules, it's just atoms. Atomic solid. 
Okay. Any questions?